por favor. Got it. Mm -hmm. Então, oh. are we ready? Hello. Yes, ready, ready. Let's go. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to say a few words before uh, Claudia begins the presentation. So, thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Zoom in <and> there <laughs> if you are in person with all this rain in, in Florianopolis. <laughs> So unfortunately, today I was not able to be there with Claudia in person, but I'm following from here, excellent. So thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to my colleague, Bruno de Azevedo, Dr. Bruno de Azevedo, for accepting uh, to moderate this session. Um, as I said last time, uh, oh, this is the, Lecture number three from the BGE lecture series. Um, uh, this opportunity for we have three postdoctorates at Mucu de Estudos em Leitura. So we saw this as an opportunity to present some of the work that we have been developing at NEL. So thank you very much for the three of them. Patricia was the first one, and then Chris, and now today, Claudia, okay? So, um, and now this year is becoming 20 years old. <laughs> so we began, I think we began in fact before 2002, it was just that uh, Diretório de, de Grupos de Pesquisa began in 2002. So that is the year that NEO and other research groups in Brazil uh, became part of the Diretório, okay? So it's time for celebrating. I'm just going to say a few words about uh, Claudia, the doctor uh, Claudia Winfield, is an adjunct professor at Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná, UTFPR, uh, campus Pato Branco. Uh, she's from uh, the course in, in letters, Portuguese and English. She has both an MA and a doctorate in language studies from the PGE uh, with NEL. <laughs> under my supervision, and an undergraduate course from, uh, from PUC, Sao Paulo, in language and literature. Uh, she lived in England for nine years, where she taught Portuguese as a foreign language at Kingsway College and Westminster Adult Education College, and also in private institutions there. Uh, she has taught English as a foreign language abroad and also in Brazil. And she has experience in translation and also editing text in the area of health in the pair English Portuguese. And her academic interests include the cognitive aspects of reading comprehension and their interaction with writing processes in L2. And also the cognitive aspects of teaching and learning in L2. And as I said before, she's a member uh, of NEL. Uh, and the moderator, uh, Professor Dr. Bruno de Azevedo. Uh, he works at uh, Campus São Lourenço do Oeste, Instituto Federal de Santa Catarina, in basic education and technology. And he also has an MA and a doctorate from the BGE, also uh, with me as a supervisor. And um, he has a specialist degree in English teaching from Chapecó. He also has an undergraduate degree in three languages, Portuguese, English, and Spanish. Uh, in his doctorate, he investigated the processing of reading comprehension in a multitasking environment. And he also has a title in English teaching from Canada, TESOL, 
at the, from the International Language Academy of Canada. And at present, he works with English as an additional language. And he is also a member of NEL. So having said this, so now I just give the floor to Claudia and to begin her presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? I guess so. Yes, the mic, is the mic working well? Thank you. So yes. um, thank you very much. So I'd like to say hello, good afternoon to everyone and here in person and online. Thank you very much for uh, being here, um, sharing this moment with me. And before everything begins, I would really like to thank you, thank my advisor, Professor Leda, for accepting me for this postdoctoral study. I was her MA and PhD student, and I had a very, very remarkable experience during this phase. It was a phase of learning, sharing knowledge, constructing knowledge that really changed my academic and my academic professional and personal life. So thank you very much. And I am looking at the camera, but I know that Leda is there, so I'm, I, I, I can see you there. <laughs> thank you very much for everything, really. Uh, I really thank uh, the Postgraduate Studies in English, PPGI, for um, accepting me. Thank you, Professor, Professor Celso, the coordinator and who was my co-advisor in the MA and my teacher. Um, thank you very much, really, for this um, opportunity again. I would like to thank Bruno Azevedo for accepting to be my mediator and share his knowledge, contribute to my research. So it's a real pleasure to have you here. So I will then begin this presentation. I will uh, explain how I will carry out uh, the presentation today. I will be uh, reading the slides most of the time in order to keep focus and not waste time because we have a, I have a, a lot of content to cover. So I'll be sometimes looking at the slides and reading it to you, okay? So this first, this first phase will be the presentation. After that, I will be uh, conversing with Bruno and also people who are present who have time to ask questions, make comments, talk to me. And, uh, and people who are with us on Zoom will be able to participate as well. So let's begin. So the title of my presentation is Preliminary Readings About Biliteracy, Possible Directions, Metalinguistic Awareness and Transfer Processes. Okay. I'm Claudia Marquez Winfield. My supervisor is Professor, Professor Leda Tomic. Thank you. Okay. We are changing the slide. And here you have the contents of my presentation. So what we are doing today, we are, we'll, I'll show you my introduction in which I show the contextualization, justification, and type of study that I'm carrying out for this postdoctoral research. Um, I will talk about the basic research that I'm doing about the topic of bilingualism um, and the evolution of the concept uh, with a focus on the studies of Hammers and Blank 2004. Uh, I'll move on to the topic of literacy to consider a model of literacy and then move on to bilingual literacy, bringing studies from Perfetti and Maron from 1998 for the model and more current studies as, for example, Bataigit et al. 2022. Uh, following that topic, we'll move on to factors that are associated with bilingual literacy and reading. I'm especially interested in metalinguistic awareness and L1 to L1 transfer processes. So some of the authors that I've um, selected and read are, are the following. By Alice Stock and Ryan, 1985. By Alice Stock and Majumder, 1998. By Alice Stock and Martin, tw uh, 2003. Columbus and Golden Meadow, 1990. Um, following that, we'll discuss biliteracy, 
which is a quite a uh, recent concept. Uh, for that, I rely on Brenton and Kinger, and I brought a, a, a study from Wigglesworth et al. about a particular uh, cultural community. And to end up, we have the final remarks of my preliminary results and future directions of this research. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I bring this very, very famous quote from the, for the people who study bilingualism. This is a famous quote. So neurolinguistics beware. The bilingual is not two monolinguals in one person. This, is, this was um, uh, the title of an article that's very well cited by Gus Gian, uh, 1989. And the, the topic of the article, the proposition of the article is a shift. Uh, so in, in how bilingualism is seen uh, from a view from monolingual studies to bilingual studies. So re I'll read this again to make it clearer. This is a frequently cited quote in the literature that indicates a shift in how bilingualism has been perceived moving from a monolingual to a bilingual perspective of this dynamic and complex phenomenon. So uh, what does that mean? Um, what the article proposes and what we, it has been discussed for some time now is that researchers, teachers, professors, people interested in bilingualism are not looking at bilingualism considering the monolingual as a model. And what does that mean? I'll give you an example. If I consider, for example, a child's development in reading, and uh, this child is bilingual, this child is learning to read, for example, in English and Spanish. She's from a Spanish community in the United States, for example. Uh, if I look at her development well, based on monolingual parameters, I may consider that her development is not adequate perhaps because of her vocabulary range or the speed in which she's acquiring uh, reading in English, for example. But that would not be fair because this child is dealing with two language systems. So we are looking at parameters that consider somebody dealing with more than one language system. It's a different view. So this is the shift that this uh, quote represents and that guides my research and the way in which studies today are carried out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the int introduction, contextualization, justification, and type of study. Uh, contextualization. The, presence, uh, the presentation summarizes the result of preliminary readings of a postdoctoral study about literacy and reading development of bilingual children. Justification. Considering the increasing emergence of bilingual initiatives in education across the world, uh, several issues appear. Among them, the relationship between literacy and the development of bilingualism. Type of study. The study follows a bibliographical research method for the selection, grouping, and analysis of sources according to the aforementioned research topics. Basic research evolution of bilingualism as a concept. Uh, so defining bilingualism is a complex task. Impacting factors include levels of proficiency in the two languages of the speakers, the frequency of use of those languages, as well as the context and situations in which the languages are used and the interaction between the two languages. First, we have the classical definition of bilingualism proposed by Bloomfield, 1935. The scholar had defined the bilingual as a person, as an individual with, a, with perfect command of the two languages, the mother tongue and a second language, which I refer to as L2. And the parenthesis here, I'm referring to L2 as an umbrella term. I know that we can talk about additional languages and other ways of classifying um, a second language. But as this is the most cited uh, form in the literature, I, for, for the moment, I use L2 as an umbrella term. Um, however, this definition 
of bilingualism, the previous one from Bloomfield, is not adequate for contemporaneity. According to Bayala's talk, to, uh, 2001, Hammers and Blank, 2004, McKay, 1971, Marcelino, 2009, Megali, 2005, to, uh, 2018, among many others. McKay, 1971, for example, has expanded the concept and suggested that a bilingual person is the one who has at least one communicative skill such as reading, writing, speaking, or listening to, use of a second, to the use of a second language. Furthermore, the author problematizes the concept of bilingualism, which can vary according to the degree, function, alternation of language use, and interference between the languages involved. In line with Grodian, 1989, Hammers and Blank discuss bilingualism as a dynamic phenomenon that occurs in several situations related to languages in contact. In a comprehensive publication, in their book, the authors focus on bilingualism as linguistic behavior or and offer bilingual models of processing and development. Social, cultural, educational, neuropsychological, and psycholinguistic issues are discussed by means of a critical review of previous studies. As a result, the authors propose the concept of bilinguality, which includes cognitive, situational, and contextual aspects of the phenomenon. Uh, here we have a model of bilinguality proposed by Hammers and Blank. Um, I will uh, focus on the dimensions that they propose. So what they are proposing is that there are several ways in which bilingualism is manifested. And we can organize those several ways considering certain dimensions. And the dimensions they propose are Number one, according to competence in both languages. So you can have two types of bilinguality. For example, bi balanced bilinguality or dominant biling bilinguality. When you consider balanced bilinguality, you have e uh, equal competence in both languages. When you have dominant bilinguality, you have competence in the L1 uh, greater uh, or smaller than L2. And uh, I'd like to call your attention to the classification of the languages in the comments here. Uh, they refer to LA or L1 and LB or L2. When the authors refer to L1, it's the mother tongue. When the authors relate to L2, it's their second language. When the authors re refer to LA and LB, it's when it, it's the situation in which L1 and L2 occur simultaneously in the environment in which the person is, expo to the, is exposed. So it's a different classification. Uh, so following the dimensions then going back. So you can also be bilingual according to your cognitive organization. So the types are compound bilinguality and coordinate bilinguality. Uh, compound, it means that uh, you have one conceptual unit, for example, and you can have two, two symbols, two codes to refer to that semantic concept. So for example, when you say apple and maçã, you have one one representation. In compound, in coordinate bilinguality, when you say apple, you have one representation. When you say matzo, it's another. So this is how they understand. And they will explain that with coordinate uh, bilinguality, it's usually when you learn the second language in, um, um, well, in an instructional setting, or maybe when, when you do not have the two languages in use simultaneously. Right, so uh, according to age of acquisition, you can have childhood bilinguality, adolescent bilinguality, and adult bilinguality. Uh, 
In childhood bilinguality, you can have simultaneous bilinguality situations in, in which the child uses and, expo and is in an environment with two languages in use. And a, a consecutive, uh, when you have the first language is acquired first and then the second. So there is a little difference. Now, moving on to the next dimension, according to the presence of L2 community in the environment. So you have endogenous bilinguality, so where the second language is present in the community, or exogenous bilinguality, when there is absence of L2 in the community. Um, the next dimension is according to the relative status of the two languages. So uh, you have additive bilinguality, a situation in which the second language or LB is valorized, and you have subtractive bilinguality uh, when the L2 is valorized at the expense of the L1. So you have uh, subtractive bilinguality. In this case, it's very common, unfortunately, in situations of minority languages. Um, and then according to group membership and cultural identity, you can have bicultural bilinguality. You can have L2 monocultural bilinguality. So maybe the person is bilingual, but the cultural identification is only with the L1. Uh, you can have L2 acculturated bilinguality. And in this case, L2 or LB membership um, you have a, a more identification with the L2. And D, the deculturated bilinguality. Uh, when you have an ambiguous membership uh, to, a, uh, to a cultural community. So that is possible too, unfortunately. It's not a very desirable situation to lose cultural identification because of the contact with another language. So these are some of the dimensions we can move on. Uh, what is very important about the model is that it's a multidimensional view. Also, the fact, the, to, uh, the distinction that the authors make. So I'll read the slides to make it clear. Uh, factors that lead to different manifestations of bilingual experience. Those were the ones on the previous slide. So the authors make a distinction between bilingualism. So bilingualism refers to the social phenomenon in which two languages are in contact. So bilingualism is the phenomenon. And while bilinguality is related to the different manifestations of the phenomenon individually. So we know that bilinguality occurs in the cases of languages in contact, but how it's manifested in the individual, that can vary. So the distinction of the concepts is part of the evolution of the concept of bilingualism. And thus bilinguality describes linguistic and cognitive dimensions that can be influenced by bilingual experiences, situations, and contexts. Uh, so for the purpose of this postdoctoral project, I will focus on bilingual literacy as an aspect of bilingual experience with a view to contributing to research in the readings, uh, in reading carried out by NEL, Núcleo de Estudios em Leitura. At this point of my study, two factors have been explored, namely the development of metalinguistic awareness in children who have experienced bilingual literacy practices and the occurrence of linguistic transfer processes from L2 and vice versa. And here I have a parenthesis. Before I started reading about bilingual literacy, I did not really uh, imagine that there could be L2 transfer as well. So from L2 to L1, it's very dynamic. Uh, so carrying on, having the model devised by Hammers and Blank 20, uh, 2004 offers the opportunity to analyze if the multi-dimensions uh, multi of bilinguality, they are relative competence, cognitive organization, age of acquisition, presence of L2, the status of languages and cultural identity, interact with the development of metalinguistic awareness and transfer processes in L2 and L2, L1 and L2. Now we are going to look at the model of literacy using following Perfetti and Maron, and then we'll talk about bilingual literacy. So according to the model, I think there was an, an image there 
maybe it's not showing on the slide, but we can move on to the next slide that, uh, ah, yeah, that's right. So you have, uh, this figure represents the model proposed by Perfetti and Maron. We'll move on to the next slide because that is an explanation. So uh, you, we had that figure with circles. The inner circle refers to one type of uh, literacy. So the, the definition of narrow, the narrow definition of literacy. What does that uh, describe? Uh, phonemes and graphemes and learning the writing system of the old one. So when we think about literacy in this, uh, with a narrow view, it means learning the phonological system, the, right, the writing system of a language, learning to read and write. Uh, a broader definition refers to acquiring the, the following sub-processes of reading, decoding, encoding, syntactic parsing, and literal comprehension. And extended definition refers to higher order sub-processes of reading, such as uh, reading interesting and comprehension monitoring. For the purpose of this research, I began looking at the narrow definition of literacy, but I understand that I will be looking at the other definitions as readings develop. Uh, right, now moving on to bilingual literacy. Reading, uh, reading regarding bilingual literacy, according to Heitzma and Verhoeven, 1998, research on L2 literacy can help inform the acquisition of bilingual literacy, in particular with regard to the transfer of orthographic, phonological, and semantic skills between languages. Um, so uh, these, were, uh, these, these were previous studies. A more recent study, for example, Babaigit et al. Uh, have investigated cognitive aspects, and these aspects were memory, novel word reading, uh, novel, sorry, novel, novel word learning and cognitive inhibition skills, uh, together with vocabulary and word reading and bilingual reading comprehension. Following, findings support previous studies about cognitive strengths in bilinguals, but indicate that vocabulary and word reading affected reading comprehension which is an interesting uh, find. Let's uh, move on uh, to the next slide. So um, we are now looking at, in more detail, uh, at some factors that may impact bilingual literacy. Uh, so factors associated with bilingual literacy and reading, metalinguistic awareness, transfer of reading skills between L1 and L2. Right. Um, when we, if we take the multidimensional view of Amherst and Blank um, cons and consider the dimension of competence or proficiency in other scholars um, use, um, I'll comment on a study about that. So with regard to bilingual competence levels, by Stock and Majander in 1998, investigated bilingual language processing in children uh, taking into account the language awareness levels and bilingual competence levels of these children. Children were grouped into monolingual, partially bilingual, and fully bilingual. The results of their experimental studies demonstrate that higher, uh, higher levels of bilingualism, uh, bilingualism are associated with higher levels of metalinguistic awareness. So we, we, we have here the effect of proficiency or competence uh, correlating with metalinguistic awareness. Uh, the, authors, uh, the, authors, the authors have examined bilingualism as well as language and non-language skills of bilingual children, namely problem-solving skills, language, language acquisition, metalinguistic ability, and literacy. So um, contrary to previous assumptions, findings have indicated that ben a beneficial influence of bilingualism on children's cognition as bilinguals are led to acquire and, and manipulate two language systems, which in turn demand more control of attention 
compared to monolingual children. Uh, however, it should, be understood, it should not be understood that this search uh, leads to consensus regarding the, ex the existence of a bilingual advantage. So it's not a consensus, although there are some studies that show uh, positive results in com comparing bilinguals to monolinguals, it's not a consensus. So authors such as Azevedo, Gomes de Lima, 2022, Brenton Van Finger, 2020, Zimmer, Finger and Scherer, 2008, um, point to this fact that it's, there is not a consensus in the literature yet. Uh, having said that, I will refer to some myths uh, related to bilingualism. So, uh, there were previous assumptions that associated bilingualism with uh, some negative effects. I'll talk about them. So, beliefs that bilingualism would be harmful to language development. Beliefs that, con uh, that contact with second language could generate confusion and hinder literacy and literacy processes. These myths have been refuted by empirical studies such as by, by Ali Stock, 2001, 2007, Bloss, 2009, Brenton and Finger, 2020, among others. So um, those myths, um, they are very, very connected to that view of the monolingual view um, uh, that prevailed when we looked at bilingual experiences. Uh, it's important to say before I refer to this slide that that view was um, very, very um, disseminated in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, many scholars who looked at bilingual uh, experiences, bilingual speakers, um, had the monolingual as the norm, and many of this, those studies and research experiences were in English-speaking countries, such as the U as USA or England, where English was the norm. So in those situations, uh, having a second language, for example, in an American society, um, uh, having a speaker of Spanish, for example, um, would be... Uh, would be considered sometimes, well, they looked at their language development as not, uh, not as good as, for example, the development of a monolingual. So that kind of view uh, created some of those myths that today we, uh, we know have been refuted uh, due to research. Okay, so we got some studies here um, from Biola Stockman, Jander, and Martin. And this is a study from 20, uh, 2003. Four groups of children who were learning to read. Uh, there were three groups composed of bilinguals in Spanish, English, Hebrew, English, and Chinese English language pairs. The fourth group consisted of monolinguals. All children in the bilingual groups used two languages in their routines and were learning to read in their L1 and L2. Study tasks consisted of phonological awareness and decoding tasks and were performed by all children. The research results suggested an improvement in the reading processes of bilingual children in relation to mo the monolingual group. Uh, transfer of literacy skills was identified in the group involving two alphabetic systems, which demonstrates the relevance of this factor uh, of transferring reading and writing skills between L1 and L2. Conclusions, um, transfer of skills between L1 and L2 occur depending on factors such as the types of linguistic system involved, children's proficiency levels in the L2, and mode of acquisition and of writing in L2. When we look at the conclusions, uh, we see that um, comparing to the model, uh, the multidimensional model of Hammers and Blank, one factor that was not listed there was the type of alphabetical system, which is a factor to be considered. And I think that's quite um, important if we are talking about literacy. So it's a factor that's not in that model, but we need to take into account if we are going to think about uh, biliteracy or 
bilingual literacy. Okay. Um, I refer now to uh, uh, an article by Gloss, which is a, bi a bibliographical review. Um, and there are some interesting uh, findings there too. So according to Bloss 2009, the experience of dealing with two distinct linguistic systems apparently leads to an improvement of metalinguistic awareness at phonological, morphological, and syntactic levels. Uh, so talking about those, uh, the, level, the two levels here, morphological and syntactic. Uh, comparing uh, a comparative study about morphological awareness with monolingual and bilingual children learning to read was carried out by Bialystok 1986. The study tasks involved reading and counting words in sentences in two conditions, meaningful organized sentences and scrambled sentences. No difference uh, of uh, results in these scrambled sentences, but better results for bilingual children in the meaningful and organized sentences. A better ability to separate meaning and, meaning and form and to control uh, or to inhibit distractions from the general meaning of sentences by bilinguals was seen as a, as a result of this study. So the, the, the authors concluded the author by also concluded that bilinguals had better ability to inhibit uh, uh, distractions when they had to uh, distinguish form and meaning in comparison to monolinguals. The next study is about syntactic awareness. So a syntactic awareness study carried out by by Alistok Majumdar 1998 and by by and Ryan and Ryan 1985. There were comparative studies between bilinguals and monolinguals in grammatically judgment ta tasks that have been examining, including studies involving grammatically, uh, grammaticality judgments with distractions and studies without distractions. Judgment of grammaticality did show advantages for bilinguals when there were no distractors. Uh, and this is according to the Lambos and Golden Medal 1999. So again, at syntactic levels, there was an advantage for bilinguals when they had to inhibit distractions. Okay, next one. Now we follow, we focus on the concept of biliteracy. And I refer to Brenton and Finger and a, and a very, very recent study, it goes worse at all, 2021. Okay, so the concept of biliteracy. Uh, not, it's not just the mere mastery of reading and writing constructed in two different languages. But rather than that, it's the development of cognitive and linguistic capacities for representing the world and representing thought that involve the subject's complete linguistic repertoire. That is, uh, that occurs from their two languages in different contexts and communicative in, uh, intention. Mm -hmm. So um, the authors uh, refer to Cummins and, they, and his common underlying proficiency model um, as cited in Bentoni Finger 2020, page six. So what did, what did they say? Uh, bilingual children do not undergo different processes when developing language skills in their two languages. Uh, the author proposes that these skills are centralized in a single system that contains the repertoire that's being built by the child. Yet this repertoire is not divided into L1 and L2 in bilingual children. For this reason, it is possible to predict the transfer of communication skills and underlying cons uh, conditions from L1 to L2 and vice versa, in the finger 2020. Um, and that we can uh, refer to Hammers and Blank 2004, cognitive organization, when you have one, um, two codes for one semantic representation. When you have uh, Massa and Apple referring to one semantic organization, for example, so a single system that a repertoire for L1 and L2 that are not separate. Uh, right. And Cummings proposed that communication skills like speaking, listening, reading, and writing are composed of underlying skills 
some of which can be understood as metalinguistic awareness and their subdivisions and its subdivisions. Okay. Uh, so as we have um, a single linguistic repertoire, it's possible uh, that, that gives us some teaching and learning possibilities. For instance, in, when it comes to li literacy, consecutive biliteracy or simultaneous biliteracy. So teaching children to read and write in two languages. What is a conse consecutive biliteracy? The, so the definition. Uh, in consecutive bi uh, biliteracy, literacy in the L1 is acquired first so that literacy in the L2 can begin. So first, the children learn to read and write in the L1 and then they begin in the L2. Um, with simultaneous biliteracy, it, you have a simultaneous situation. Simultaneous biliteracy is a more recent practice that has occurred due to the increase of contexts and situations of bilingualism in childhood in contemporary times. In the case of simultaneous biliteracy, literacy and in L1 and L2 can occur in parallel, and that's possible, and there are several studies uh, that have report, been reporting on practices of, bilit of simultaneous biliteracy. Bilit biliteracy. Okay. Uh, when it comes to transfer of reading skills from L1, from L2 and L2 to L1, in line with research by Bayala, Sokma, Jumder, and Martin, 2003, and the review of previously mentioned studies by Bloss, 2009, the Drenta 19 or 2020 emphasized that the bilingual experience promotes the establishment of automatic association between languages in children that can speed up the process of bilingual literacy or biliteracy. In addition, the authors corroborate the possibility of transfer of reading skills between languages in bilinguals. Uh, so the, the effect of speeding up literacy is quite interesting. Um, uh, I thought when I read. Okay, moving on. And this is, uh, I'm just reporting on a very interesting study that I found <laughs> during these preliminary readings. This is an app, and it's a biliteracy app. So it's from um, uh, a community uh, uh, in Australia. So I'll, be, I'll uh, talk about this study, summarize it here. Uh, issues related to biliteracy in minority language contexts are the subject of recent articles, for example, Wigglesworth and the, and the group, who report on a study carried out in Australia in the East Armham land region, where the majority of the population are composed of indigenous Australians. The study examines a, bi a bilingual literacy experience involving the local language and the English language in which an app was used to, uh, to sim stimulate phonological awareness in both languages, with the local language being based on the old Roman alphabet, but presenting differences in relation to the English alphabet. Some challenges found were related to phon phonetic differences that were worked from decoding strategies, and other challenges inherent to cultural aspects were overcome through intervention by disciplinary teams. And I want to explain this cultural um, issue. Uh, in, uh, in the indigenous language, you have some proper names that are similar or the same as some certain common names. So maybe a person could be called Dor, okay? And Dor is a, is a common name. Uh, but in the, in the indigenous community, the tradition is that when a person dies, uh, depending on the level, on the family relationship that you have, you do not say this person's name anymore. So there were some words in the app that are also proper names, and they were, and that influenced results. So they had to deal with that. Uh, issue in, in that experience. I thought that was an interesting example of a cultural factor that we would not imagine, but an interesting um, practice as well to have an app for meta, for meta linguistic awareness. Moving on. Uh, right, uh, so thinking about uh, biliteracy. 
since both literacy and development of reading and writing are activities that require attention, effort, cognitive resources, and systematized instruction, it is essential that teachers interested in literacy in bilingual contexts build knowledge about bilingualism, literacy, reading, and writing to adequately mediate bilingual literacy, as well as experiences involving biliteracy, whether consecutive or simultaneous. Uh, in view of the cognitive demand of biliteracy, Brentano and Finger 2020 emphasize that any learning process is a consequence of the use of the aforementioned cognitive resources. Therefore, such demand should not be seen as negative or problematic as long as the learning process is coherent with the child's level of cognitive development. Furthermore, the author stress that neuroscience explains that such learning challenges strengthen neural connections, which is desirable for the intellectual development and, hum uh, and human beings as a whole. Mm -hmm. So my final remarks, um, my preliminary results and future, future directions. So uh, preliminary results of um, this uh, research, uh, we looked at bilingualism concepts and the evolution of the concept and specifically the uh, distinction between bilingualism and bilinguality and the model and the multidimensional model by Havers and Blank. Uh, in literacy, we looked at literacy, uh, at the literacy model by Perfetta Moron, considering narrow, broader, and extended by, uh, literacy, and looked at bilingual literacy and skills transfer. Uh, the, uh, we also looked at uh, metalinguistic awareness in, when there were interacting factors that we identified and the factors were proficiency and task conditions. Uh, when we looked at L1 and L2 transfer, we looked at factors such as competence and alphabetical systems influencing transfer, the occurrence of, tra of transfer or not. And we also looked at literacy as a concept and also as a practice that could be as consecutive by literacy and simultaneous by literacy, considering that uh, we were dealing with a, a single system. And finally, uh, future directions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I will finish my readings of Hammers and Blank. Uh, so I'll, my, my future directions are these. The first one, number one, basic research, conclude readings. Number two, the study design. So I will elaborate a systematic bibliography review for the selection of materials and the conclusion of the bibliographical study. Uh, number three, read more about bilingual literacy and, bi and biliteracy. So focusing on metalinguistic awareness and L1, L2 transfer. And finally, number four, I intend to analyze synthesized findings, make connections, and write an article. Um, that's basically what I have in mind for now. Uh, and these are my references. And I'd like to thank you very much for being here with me. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, well, I don't know if you really can sit down or if you're going to stand up to interact with Bruno. <laughs> What is best? Can decide. Yeah, because we here at Zoom. Uh, let me see. Well, shall I sit down or stand up? I prefer to sit down, but if I, it's okay if I need to stand, yeah. stand up, I don't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the only thing is that I think you are not looking at Bruno, in fact, because, yeah, you have to look. Yeah, this okay. Way. Yeah. So yeah, so people online can see me. <laughs> Technology and the new hybrid <laughs> vibe. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so now we move to this second part um, where Bruno is going to mediate, just talk to Claudia about a few issues that we probably have selected. And I'm going to ask those uh, in Zoom to put their questions here in the chat. So maybe we can. So later, after.
Bruno's interaction with Claudia, we can just talk about your questions. Okay. So thank you very much, Bruno. The floor. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to especially thanks Leda and and Claudia for the opportunity to 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 learn a little bit from your research, which is a topic that I especially love. Uh, some of the readings that you mentioned, uh, I've I've made, and some of uh, and others they were new to me, and I found your talk very inspiring and very uh, knowledgeable for all of us. So first, congratulations on, on this um, stage, let's say. I don't know if it's a phase of the, the postdoc, but congratulations. I thought that your, your presentation and the review that you sent me, they were very concise, you know, very well built. I really loved that you made this, that you brought this classical definition of uh, bilingualism, which in fact, we um, have a very nice comment to make about this. I work in a, in a, in a city, in the, the, the city in which my campus is located, they have a bilingual project in, in schools, in the municipal schools. And they are implementing this bilingual um, uh, project in, in kids, you know, but as you read the law that implemented this bilingual project, you see that this classical definition, it is classical only in the literature, you know, you see that in some uh, spheres in the education in practices, this is still something that uh, uh, teachers and politicians and these policymakers, they, they are not aware of what in fact is bilingualism. And I really loved uh, the fact that you brought this. And I would like to know if you have, this is a very, you know, uh, food for thought question, but have you considered working on this bilingual education stances uh, with your students in the latest program in the future? What are your, you know, your aspirations, have you considered? I don't know if Pato Branco has any, any project like that. Um, I would like to hear a little bit about you. Well, thank you very much, Bruno, for, first of all, thank you for being here. And before I answer your question, I want to comment uh, on the fact that, yes, I, I found out that you were interested in bilingualism when I attended your uh, PhD uh, defense and you talked about the topic and then we talked about when we got in touch I got in touch with you we talked about bilingualism and you shared some of your articles you were the one who introduced me to Brentano in finger 2020 so thank you very much for that and for the articles that you shared for sharing knowledge uh, so thank you <laughs> for that and um, I think it's always very important to acknowledge what um, the, the contributions that people give. Um, right, so um, about your question. Um, and also I have to, to thank you for your comments. I, uh, I was a bit anxious about this presentation because these are preliminary readings and the topic is quite complex. There is a lot to know. Uh, but thank you so much. It um, it was very nice to to have uh, these initial results well accepted. And about your question, well, I have to begin uh, talking about my curiosity. Uh, I wanted to I I don't know. I've always been curious about the ex the bilingual experience and wanted to to know what research knows. So. This is something that um, it's a personal interest, really. Um, but as you said, if I want to, uh, you, you, if I intend to share this, uh, these results and what share my knowledge about it, the knowledge that I'm building about it with the students I, I have at UTFPR and Pato Branco, 
Uh, yes, for sure, I want. I'm already prepared. I've already offered um, um, an optativa, an, 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 an optional uh, subject for our course about bilingualism, because I think it's important that we bring that to the undergraduate students, because they will come across uh, uh, bilingual education uh, context. And if I'm interested in bilingual education contexts, um, I am from an intellectual point of view, especially uh, because like you said, the classical definition is still what uh, people many times have in mind. And that worries me, especially when I think about the undergraduate students who work in bilingual schools, and they have many, many times they have expectations from the parents and the community that certain things can be achieved. Um, and sometimes they're not <laughs> uh, according to the models that they have in mind. So I think it's very important that we know more about it. We uh, who are interested in the topic and our, so that we can guide our students better so that they can guide uh, their kids and the parents and the community a little bit better about bilingualism. Um, I am not so involved with, uh, with the language policies. Um, although, yes, very important, and I'm not saying that I don't, that I don't care about that, not in the slightest, I do care, but it's not my, my expertise. Um, I, uh, but I think it's very important that those who are planning those uh, edu bilingual education um, practices have more knowledge about how complex it is. So if I'm interested, yes, I am. I am, um, so I'm offering a new subject and I go back uh, for the undergraduate students and I will, uh, I will uh, prepare a new course for the postgraduate um, department as well. I intend to do that, to be able to, to share this knowledge. And there is, uh, about projects, there is a project in Pato Branco that is uh, English para crianças, but it's an initiative in which the kids have contact with English once a week uh, in the uh, in preschool settings and, and uh, pr uh, first years of primary school. It's not as, well, the contact is uh, only once a week, so there is not a lot of exposure, but it is already something. Uh, and if we can guide the practices so the, the, the kids can make the most of it. So, so well, I think we can, we can offer this uh, opportunity to the kids in the, in the municipality. There is this project in Pato Branco and Francisco Beltrão, so we beginning that. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Um, in fact, while you were you were speaking, I I remembered an event that I went. I think it was when B in Brasilia. That, if I'm not mistaken, the name of the researcher is Denise Nobre. I don't know if it's Denise Nobre. It's, it's, it is the one that was the coordinator of Idioma Sem Fronteiras. Maybe Leda remembers her name better than me. It, it's Denise something. I remember the last name. Um, she was the coordinator of Idiomas Sem Fronteiras. And then uh, one thing that she said, like, marked my memory. I, I never forgot that she said that one of the issues uh, of Ciencias Sem Fronteiras that people said that, oh, a lot of students are going on tours. They are not enjoying the opportunity the government is providing. And then they said that one of the mistakes of the, the this policy makers is that they did not consult the linguists, she said. They did not consult us. They did not check with us what was the best policy for uh, for for this uh, language development of these students, that these undergraduate students that went abroad. You know, so it then it, it, that marked me that we have a, a very huge responsibility as you know, as professors, as teachers, as researchers, that we we must try at some point inform and uh, converge and converse as well with these policymakers because 
uh, they might have a very nice idea for a project, but if they don't have the expertise, it might fail, you know? So it, it is something that I really, it, it marked me and I, I remember when, we, when you were saying. Um, another thing that I really liked uh, that you brought is this, is this, yeah, that's the name, Denise Martins de Abreu Lima. Yeah, I, I mistaken the last name. Um, so one of the things that I liked that is that you brought the, the, the concept of bilinguality. I think that's the pronunciation. This is something new to me because, well, it, it, if I understood it kind of makes the bilingual experience something that individuals vary, you know, and the, it is something related to the indiv individuality of each uh, bilingual. And that makes me think, and then I wanna hear your, your opinion about this, how hard it is for us researchers to compare, you know, bilinguals, monolinguals as they call, because it is this spectrum of bilingual experiences. You know, it, it is very hard to put bilinguals in a box and compare them because there is this concept of bilinguality that you brought, you know, that we have different experiences, we have different contact. And then, and then I wanna know what, how you feel about that? Because I think this was, if I'm not mistaken, the heart of your presentation. Yes, um, thank you for your question. Um, right, so what I, what I noticed reading some of the articles is that in, in several of the studies, um, when the participants were described, um, they were, they were in, in some cases, they were classified not just as monolinguals or bilinguals, but what type of bilinguals they were. Um, sometimes there was also reference to age of acquisition. So I guess that the bilinguality, I thought it was bilinguality, but bilinguality, good, thank you. Um, I think the concept underlies some recent studies. Well, I say that because I noticed in the way in which the participants were described in several of the articles that I read. So, uh, but it's a very important point when I to keep in mind when I have the my the following texts, the following articles that I'll read to consider what what concept of bilinguality underlies the description of the subjects because um, I think that many um, at least when I when I read by Alice talk studies I, I you know this author and we know that she does a lot of research in the field and I guess she she now she you can see in her studies that she describes the different types of uh, bilingual individuals and makes it clear in the research, but it's a point, it's an important point for me to look at when I analyze articles, because it is very difficult really to classify, but having, uh, having the multidimensional model, uh, at least it gives you a structure from which to work uh, when we think about different types of bilinguals. Because I, I, there is another article by Marcelino and he refers to way and they say there is more than a hundred types of bilingual. So, I mean, we cannot really make a taxonomy of all, all of them, but some of these dimensions that were organized, I think can help us uh, make some distinguish, distinctions between the types of bilinguals that can uh, exist. And in the case of um, my research, how does that affect literacy and reading development? How to teach to read and write in bilingual settings? How to, uh, how to make the most of, uh, uh, of uh, biliteracy? As we saw that from Brenton and Finger's findings, um, transfer processes can even speed up literacy and reading processes. So how to make use of what we know, for example, in reading, what we know from our studies in our group here about reading, 
how can we use what we know from reading to make uh, um, biliteracy practices more advantageous to our students. And that's something that I am interested in. So what kind of strategies are advisable? Uh, what are the problems that may arise? One of the studies that I, I, I referred to today, a recent one, um, or the one from Baba Igit, showed that contrary to other assumptions, uh, although bilingualism um, had a positive uh, correlation with better cognitive functions, in literacy and reading development, it was not, uh, there was a problem there. Vocabulary was a problem. Vocabulary range of bilinguals interfered negatively in their reading development. So that's something that when we think about reading research, we can use that to improve bilingual literacy practice. That's what I, I want to do. Nice. Do I have time for, for uh, another question? I don't know how long we have. Uh, yeah, Bruno, sure. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, well, while I was reading your 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 text and in your talk, the a lot of the things that you said they converge with uh, the the concept that Ofelia Garcia coined of uh, translanguaging. You know that uh, we make this this thing. We 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 actually there is this distinction of the name of the languages as as she calls. And this uh, that we have one repertoire, and then the linguistic uh, repertoire is the one that in uh, students and bilingual users they use, you know. And it is very interesting to know that the, the, this this cognitive uh, field is moving towards this concept of translanguaging, because if you see that. Uh, this unique language repertoire. It's not only that students, they make this exchanges and this code switching. And it, well, it seems to me that when we call code switching, we are considering lingu uh, languages as a code and not as this unique system in which uh, I believe that we have this unique system because especially in as you get more proficient in the languages, things kind of get blurry and these boundaries are more difficult for, for you to see. And then you said something that it made me think about this, this uh, translanguaging and the concept of, of uh, language system. It is when you talked about the, the representation that we make and you use the example of Apple, I guess. You said that, um, I'm trying to recall now, but you said that we have different representations depending on the language. And then um, I was thinking how, how that is possible if you consider that, well, but some of the same authors, they are saying that we have one linguistic sis, uh, system, one repertoire. How come can we have different representations? I don't expect an answer for that, but it's, it's something that, you know, I was, uh, reflecting on while you were speaking. I don't know if you followed my line of, uh, of thinking here. Yes, thank you for the question because it's something else that also uh, got me thinking while I was <laughs> uh, reading and it's in the multi-dimensional model. Um, it's according to the model, according to these authors, Hammers and Blank, you can have two different types of cognitive organization. One in which you have these uh, two codes and one semantic representation. So you have apple and maçã, and you have one semantic representation in the person's cognition. This is, the, this is one possibility, according to what I understood there. Um, and that's called uh, compound. So yeah, compound organization. Um, uh, from what I read and understood, that's very common in the situations in which a person is exposed to a bilingual environment. So 
two languages coexist in that environment, environment. So the child is acquiring language and the child acquires two possible codes to one semantic representation. But it's also possible, according to Hammers and Blank, to have a situation in which one, when you have the word maçã, you have a certain representation. When you have the word apple, you have maybe a slightly different representation. And that's, according to the authors, that is more typical of situations in which uh, a person was exposed to the second language later or in instructional settings, not in, it was not the there was not the coexistence of the two languages in the environment. And so they say that those two things are possible. When I read Brentano and Finger, and they talked about the one system, so that we, in bilingual children, you have this one system, and, the and then there's this repertoire of language formed by L1 and L2. And now, too, the authors also talked about bilingualism in situations in which exposure to the language was very intense. They do when so when when Brenton and Finger talk about biliteracy and the practices that they propose, they did they did say that in the article that exposure was very intense. So I think again, I mean. Um, according to 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 Hammers and Blank, two two things are possible. Those two ways of uh, having the two languages are possible, and that's what I remember from Brenton and Finger that caught my attention. Yes, we can talk about biliteracy. Yes, we can, but we are talking about situations in which the children in biliteracy practices. The, that is possible in situations in which exposure is intense. That's what I, I understood. <laughs> but I, it, it caught my attention as well. I don't know if they don't want to help us. <laughs> yeah, it is hard because you know we have we have this definition in this this cognitive in psycholinguistics, in the cognitive psychology, and then we have the other uh, the other fields. Uh, in the in the same area that they, they are they, they are using another term, but sometimes things uh, things kind of get blurry, you know, and then these concepts they get intertwined. So it is something that for me at least it's very difficult to make a differentiation because for me it's they kind of complement each other. I don't know. Some researchers might disagree with me, <laughs> but I, I well I see it that way at mm. least. I don't um, know. Like to help. Yes. <laughs> Bruno, so you were saying that there would be one single presentation which would be assessed in by the two codes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. For instance, we have this one repertoire and we kind of don't have a different representation for the uh, for, for, for apples, for instance that we would have a, this unique representation because we have this unique system and we have this unique bilingual brain as well. Uh, uh, and there are this. studies, in fact, showing that this is right. Well, Claudia is talking about two. But for example, Marion and colleagues, she has this study with Russian and English. And uh, she found evidence for one code, one rep uh, semantic representation with, in, in both. So uh, this is also possible. Um, sorry, there is a, a question. We can come back to you, Bruno, if you have any other questions later. Well, let's see if the audience has questions. The, the audience has one question. I can read it to you, okay? Okay, Claudia. Yes? From Maria Ito Caso. Ito Caso? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Claudia, for your presentation. Considering the relationship between biliteracy and linguistic awareness, is it possible to say that acquiring a second language and building literacy in it 
could improve education as a whole? Well, uh, from what I read, um, I would say that it can, uh, it can, as long as we um, it consider every well, every situation, consider all the factors involved in every situation. Um, I don't know if uh, if I answer your question, but yes, I don't think it would be. It, I think it's something that is beneficial, uh, but it depends on every in every situation. Um, consensus, and yeah, so yes, I I think something that my Aristotle says. <laughs> There is a saying that I quoted in some, um, um, I wrote a, a chapter for a, a book organized by a colleague, and then I brought this quote by, by Alisok, I don't know it word for word, but she said that uh, knowing more has always been better than knowing less. So yes, it, it by, it's, it's beneficial, I, I think. Thank you for your question, Maria, uh, by the way. And I think, yes, I think it can improve education, but I do not believe that there is, o there is only one recipe for improving education. I think we can promote bilingual uh, education experiences, uh, but they have to be informed by research. Uh, also, when we talk about bilingual education, we also have to be very careful about uh, valorizing um, all the languages involved. I do not think that we should uh, prior prioritize English to the expense of Portuguese, for example. I also think that we are not looking at, uh, as Bruno mentioned, policies. We, not, we, we should be considering also bilingual education involving minority languages in Brazil. So um, uh, those things have, be, in my opinion, have to be taken into account. And any, any bilingual education uh, proposal should be based on, on research, proper research that takes into account for uh, the age of the children, the contact that they have with the language, um, the um, well, the teachers' uh, experience with the language, and when it comes to biliteracy, not only do we have to know about bilingualism, but we need to know about reading and literacy. We has to be informed uh, by researching those fields. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, uh, she said you did. So thank you for your question, Ladia. <laughs> so Bruno, do you have any other questions? No, no, I, was, I would just like to, to add something to what Claudia said. I know I, it's something that I was thinking when you brought Perfetti's model that, well, we have some, uh, one of the dimensions, I think it's the expansion one that talks about uh, comprehension monitoring and inferencing. I know that this might be into interesting, but also this uh, critical thinking and critical evaluation, in, in especially in times that we are living in which we have a lot of uh, fake news, that maybe this, this literacy and this bilingual literacy, you know, and the impact of this bilingual literacy, we, we could investigate something ideas for research, investigate at to what, to what extent is biliteracy impacts on, on people's judgments on what they read, you know, because I think that uh, since the bilingual experience is so rich, that it might have some impact. So uh, something that I was thinking while uh, you, were, you were answering Maria's question there. I think it's a really important point because it's uh, to do with contemporary times. Like we, man like we discussed last week, during this lecture um, about how much uh, the, the contact that readers have with online environments 
and now, uh, my God, everybody is reading everything from everywhere. So you could be in contact with texts and information in different languages. So I think we are ma many in contemporary times, we are translanguaging, we are dealing with, with different languages. So by literacy, maybe a, a, a contemporary need. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Uh, Claudia, maybe someone from the audience with you would like to ask a question. All right, I'll see. I think uh, questions from the audience, comments. And I think Zeus mentioned that something before about uh, bilingual advantage. Do you want to talk about it? Uh, no, I was just making this comment about um, uh, the last question asked, right, about the overall benefits, and I think it's not, we don't, we cannot be so sure about the overall benefits for education, but as you said, knowing something is better than knowing nothing, right? And um, I think it's also related to what you mentioned on the internet and finger about the use of cognitive resources. So it says this, like, uh, she says the brain likes to learn new things, right? So in that sense, uh there might be uh somehow a bilingual advantage but we have to there is still a long way to go regarding uh specific what the benefits of this bilingual advantage are right and what are the specific linguistic aspects they uh they play a role in. Thank you. Yes, because that, that's it. Uh, when we were talking about the bilingual advantage, uh, I think Juliana had this point to make, and I think I thought it was important to to consider that in this session as well. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, we do we have any more questions from the audience? No. Okay, so I think we we are uh, at, we are here. We are satisfied with the questions and comments so far. Okay, so thank you again, the audience, the audience in Zoom, and also there in person. Thank you, thank you, Bruno, for having accepted for your to participate here to moderate Claudia's talk for your comments. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, Claudia, <laughs> for giving us this very nice talk and uh, showing people uh, what you, in fact, you have just begun, as you said, right? All this is preliminary because you have just started. <laughs> but thank you very much. Okay, I have to I have to thank you too very much, Linda, for accepting me again. I have to thank you again because it's a great opportunity for me to be able to to do my postdoctoral research here, to be advised by the Professor Linda, uh, and to be with this very very active and lovely group that we have now at NEL. It's great. We are sharing our uh knowledge we are we have meetings we discuss texts it's, it's very nice really very um, uh, motivating and i would like to to thank for the opportunity to have this lecture it helped me organize my studies like my initial studies and in, it has encouraged me to carry on on the topics that i have identified so yes thank you very much for everyone who was here and for everyone online, for the questions and for uh, attending this lecture. Thank you. I hope we learned a lot. Thank you, Bruno, for our contributions. I hope we can carry on sharing knowledge and building up more knowledge together. Thank you. Sorry, Bruno. <laughs> we also thank the PGE for the invitation uh, to participate in this uh, 
PPG lecture and we called it PPG lecture series because we decided to have the three together, which in my opinion was a very good idea. It was very nice to have these three days um, with conversations and talks and inspiring <laughs> uh, all of us. So thank you to PGE. We also thank Yasmin and Carol, right, for <laughs> bearing with us in times of <laughs> new things, new. The technology is the same, but we have to deal with, now we have this hybrid event, so we have to deal with both, right, in person and online. But in the end, I think it was very, very nice. So thank you. Girls, thank you all. Uh, Bruno, I think you wanted to say a few words. I would like to, to thank you for the opportunity and for the and for the trust of counting on my on my knowledge to to somehow help you when we can debate. And I hope that we can work together in the future as well. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Okay. I can close the session now. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>